Well, it's good to be with you again today. Uh, I'm really excited about this lesson. It's one of my favorites because of the revelation that's in it. Uh, the title is kind of unusual. The title is, Does He Thank That Servant? <laughs> Which seems kind of unusual, but you'll, you'll understand why as we go through the lesson. When I talk about the revelation in it, uh, when I went back to study the uh, document that's at the website in the articles page, uh, I was surprised <laughs> that it only contained my very beginning understanding of this passage, which is in Luke 17. And there's actually been two more uh, really strong revelations that's come since then. So, you know, thank God there should be more <laughs> over time as we continue to pray and meditate the Word and mature. And so I'm going to have to update the information that's at the website. But when, uh, when this is posted, there will be a PDF uh, posted with it. And that PDF will be the very updated version with uh, the un all of the understanding revelation that I have in it up to this point. This is a great lesson. So, as you know, I've taught many times that... Uh, you know, Dave taught us to meditate the Word of God in whole images. He said, it's like looking at a painting. He says, you, you can't just look at one or two brush strokes and understand the image that's being presented in that painting. He said, no, every, every stroke of the brush is required, but all of them are required for you to see the full image. Well, the Word of God is just like that. And Dave would say, every verse is like a stroke of the brush. And Jesus is painting a picture for us that you've got to see the entire image. See, we get in a lot of trouble, a lot of false doctrine, when we lift a verse out of its setting and try and make it say something that the Bible doesn't say. And I use this old example, but when you can't improve on it, just keep using the old one. Here are two verses out of the New Testament. They're both in there. But if you just pick them out of their context and put them together, they say something that the Bible never intends. Here's the two verses. Judas went out and hung himself. Pick another one. Go thou and do likewise. <laughs> well, obviously, that's not the will of God. But you say, well, they're both Bible verses. They're both in the New Testament, you know. But you've got to leave them in their setting. Well, all of these teachings, just like the one we're going to look at today, is in a setting the entire picture is contained in Luke 15, verse 1, Luke chapter 15, verse 1, all the way through Luke chapter 17 and verse 10. And it only makes sense in that context. Trust me, preachers, even today, you can go on Christian TV that will go in there and pull out little snippets here and there and teach them out of context and preach all kinds of stuff that's just not true. But if you leave it all in the, in the setting, then it makes sense. So uh, just in case you haven't heard all of the lessons leading up to today's lessons, let me do a quick summary. Luke 15, 1 starts out with, we see Jesus out fellowshipping and among the sinners. And the Pharisees, the, you know, the, the people that are supposed to be the experts uh, in religion, that un that are, they're supposed to understand God the best, they could not understand why this, you know, Jesus, who calls himself a holy man, why, why, you could almost hear the derision in their voice, you know, why would he out, would he be out amongst these sinners, you know? <laughs> well, they don't have, they don't understand God at all. They, they don't have the heart of the Father at all. So Jesus starts trying to explain to them. Now, this is what I mean from the whole thing, starting from there all the way through Luke 17, 10, is aimed mainly at the Pharisees, or today you'd say religious people that have no heart for the lost, trying to explain the heart of God and what real ministry is about. So he starts off, for example, talking about, what well, if you had a, if you lost a sheep, wouldn't you go looking for it? Why? Well, it has value to you. If you lost a coin, wouldn't you go looking for it? Well, yeah. Why? Because it has value to you. And he's trying to get them to understand. Well, and he goes to the prodigal son, who even though that prodigal was out in the world and wasting his father's goods, the father still loved him and wanted him to come home. That prodigal had great value to the father. On and on and on the teaching goes through this whole passage where Jesus is trying to get them to understand that 
real ministry is to seek and to save the lost, okay? And, and uh, no matter what your part is in it, the end result, God's about saving this world. He's about getting his family back, if you want to know the truth of it. See, and really, you can really see the, he, Jesus tries to warn them. He says you can't serve God in, in money, but they're in religion for the money. And when you leave it in the context, that story about the rich man and Lazarus, and you know, Lazarus is a type of, of the sinner, wretched and poor and got nothing. Well, that's a type of mankind being lost. But these rich, these Pharisees are just used religion to get rich. They're not interested in that sinner at all. They step right over him. And to be honest, they're interested in fine wine and fancy living and praise of men and fancy robes and good food. And and they just step right. They don't care about Lazarus at all. Well, the same way they didn't care about those sinners at all. And see, Jesus is doing his best. I love Jesus so many for so many reasons. But boy, you talk about someone who speaks the truth in love. He tells them that parable, knowing it's going to make them so mad <laughs> that they know it's pointed at them. It's going to make them so mad they're going to want to kill him, and they eventually do. They eventually put him on the cross. But he plainly tells them, where did that rich man wind up? He wound up in hell. And he's warning them, you're going to wind up there too if you don't repent. Whew. Anyway, it's, man, when you leave it in context, it's strong. It's really strong. You better not be using religion just to get rich. Better not be using religion just to have your best life now, I'm telling you. Okay, that's another. That's not even the message today. See, all that was free. <laughs> I'm just trying to show you, though, the importance, like Dave taught us, leave every verse in its setting. Every verse is a stroke of the brush. Well, it concludes over here in Luke 17, verses 1 through 10. And Jesus is talking to him about offenses are going to come and you've got to forgive. And even when it's offenses and money and, you know, all of that teaching about forgiving people. And I love how Dave says it. He says, you know, when Jesus told him to go heal the sick, they didn't say, Lord, increase our faith. When they told him to go cast out devils, they didn't say, Lord, increase our faith. <laughs> but when he said, you got to forgive people when they offend you regarding your money, they went, Oh, our, our money? Lord, you better increase our faith. <laughs> and he really wasn't talking about money so much as he is how you steward your life and what's really important. But he concludes that whole teaching, the painting of the brush, or yeah, all the strokes of the brush to make the painting, concludes it here in verses 5 through 10. So let me just read it out of the King James. Luke 17, if you want to follow along, verses 5 through 10. And the apostles said unto the Lord, Increase our faith. And the Lord said, Well, if you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, you might say unto this sycamine tree, Be thou plucked up by the root, and be thou planted in the sea, and it should obey you. But which of you, having a servant plowing or feeding cattle, will say unto him by and by, when he has come in from the field, will you go, you go and sit down to meet? And will not rather say unto him, make ready, make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, until I have eaten and drunken, and afterward thou shalt eat and drink. Here it is. This is why this is the title of today's lesson. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not. We don't use the word trow nowadays, but what he's saying is certainly not. Certainly not. So likewise you, when you shall have done all these things which are commanded you, say, We are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. Now, I'm going to stay fairly close with the notes here and not be looking down reading all the time, but this is the first level of understanding that the Lord gave me uh, about 20 years ago. And it's still valid today, of course. So in Luke 17, 9, Jesus plainly says that a man would not thank his servant just because that servant did the things that commanded him. However, just, just, just two chapters later in the same book of Luke, when Jesus teaches the parable about the pound, you know, though I've already, we taught a few weeks ago about stewarding the pound. He reveals the, ma the master's attitude toward a faithful servant. Now here he said, say we're unprofitable servants. But notice this, in just Luke 19, 17. 
this is one of the servants that did it right, that traded the Lord's money and made an increase and brought it to the Lord. And verse 17, Luke 19, 17, And he, the Lord, said unto him, Well, like well done, well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in a very little, have thou authority over ten cities. So even though the master didn't actually use the words thank you, he was most certainly commending this good servant and gave him a promotion. Can you see that? Because he was faithful in little, he promoted him to a higher level of, of authority. See, and what we're after here in our, our passage in Luke 17, we want to understand the heart of the master toward his faithful servants. Because Jesus gave them the example of a good first-class servant. They not only go out into the field and, and do whatever it is the Lord had them doing that day, but at the end of the day, when they come in, they don't immediately go after their own needs. They still want to make sure that all the needs of the master are met first. They, un they are a first-class servant. So let's look at it again in Luke 17, 10. I want to just get this verse fresh in our mind. So likewise you, when you shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, this is your attitude, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. Now, when Jesus uses that word unprofitable, he does not mean of no value, no worth, no benefit to the kingdom of God. Jesus is trying to make them disciples after his own pattern. He himself is the son who serves, which remember how this started. We see Jesus in Luke 15, 1, out amongst the sinners seeking and saving that which is lost. Well, Jesus, the serving son, is most certainly profitable to the kingdom as he serves the father in the fields. Wouldn't you say? <laughs> I'd say, I, I think Jesus is profitable to the kingdom, but yet he's having an attitude. He wants them to say they're unprofitable servants. I'm, I'm telling you, my head just tilted. I thank God for Pastor Dave again and again telling us just read it and pray in tongues. <laughs> read it and pray in tongues, you know. <laughs> now, a second proof that Jesus is not really saying you're just a slime, you're just no good, you're unprofitable to me, is look how he uses the same wording over in Matthew 25, verse 30. It's the same story sort of as stewarding the pound, but it's a little different, but it's the same basic principles, but he calls it a talent. It's just a measure of money that they used in that day. But here he says in Matthew 25, 30, because there, there was a wicked servant there who was really unprofitable. Now, why was he unprofitable? Because he didn't do what the master told him. The master said, take this money and go increase it by trading. And he said, no. And the, we've already you know, studied this out. Why? Why did he say no? He, it's not that he was afraid of losing the money or anything like that. No, he, he tells you his motive. It's well, I've heard about you. You're going to have me do all this work and take this money and I'm going to invest it and do all of, the, all of the work of investing and increasing this money and when it's all over, you're just going to come and take all of the money and the profit? If there's nothing in it for me, I'm not doing it. <laughs> if you're just going to take all the profit, I'm not doing it. <laughs> See, that's a guy that's in it for personal profit. Okay? And that's what makes you unprofitable to the kingdom because... Jesus plainly says in, in that passage in, between Luke 15, 1 and Luke 17, 10, he said it directly to the Pharisees and really to everybody. You can not serve God and mammon. You can't. You can't serve God and money. He didn't say you could do it with great difficulty. He said you cannot. Well, when the master says you cannot, then you cannot. <laughs> so this guy... He says, well, if there's nothing in it for me, I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm not going to just serve your kingdom and give you all the money. Well, let's see what, he really is an unprofitable servant. And look what Jesus says about him. Matthew 25, verse 30. Cast ye the unprofitable servant, there it is, into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, two plus two still makes four. When Jesus says over there in Luke 17, 
say about yourselves, you're unprofitable servants. He does not want them to be this kind of unprofitable servant. That's for sure. Isn't that right? I mean, it's plain to say he doesn't want them to be this kind of unprofitable servant. What in the world? What he means there when he says, you have this attitude, we are unprofitable servants. What he's saying there, we're not in this for personal profit. We're, we're, we're doing this for love's sake alone. We are your servants, Jesus. We, we are here to serve you in the kingdom. See, and especially if you have the calling of what we, a few weeks ago, we did a service called the Min Ministry of Helps. In Romans 12, it's called the Simplicity of Giving. But if you're called to serve the kingdom in the financial arena, you of all people have got to be a servant for love's sake alone. You can't be like this unprofitable servant uh, who was in it for personal profit because you can't do both. He pl Jesus just plainly says it now. You, you cannot serve God and mammon. You just can't do it. Who do you, who's your Lord here? I like this saying. I've developed it over the years because, I, listen, I, Gary Carpenter knows what it is to serve money. I know what that is. My whole life before I got saved, was all about money. Sue and I were in our 30s. Uh, we were in the real estate business and we had a construction, uh, little constru small construction business on the side. But listen, we were in our early 30s and we were living in the right part of town in a house that had been designed by an architect for himself. I'll tell you who it was. Uh, the man was named uh, Cecil Stanfield. He was one of the architects that helped design uh, those original buildings for Oral Roberts University. And he built this house for himself. It's very nice. Well, we bought that house later. So it's a right, you know, nice architect designed house in the right side, of, right part of town. And we were driving uh, brand new Cadillac cars, not, not, not nice used ones. No, brand new. <laughs> bought off the new car lot, okay? And, um, you know, in those days I was wearing custom made suits and my time was too valuable for me to go to the tailor. So the tailor came to my office which by the way was very nice and had a big mahogany desk. I had one tie from Neiman Marcus that cost $400. I bought it on purpose just cause it cost $400. <laughs> Part of my job was to uh, impress, okay? And show authority when people came in there. And, and uh, so I'm just telling you that, see people today talk about, you know, they wanna have a goal of making six figures. You know what I mean by that? You know, listen, Sue and I were making six figures in, in, the, in the 70s. You know, uh, <laughs> so we seventies. Money was a little different. Money was valued a little different in the seventies. When you're making Sue, the w was so good in the real estate business. She one year she early and she did it more than one year. She closed a million dollars worth of real estate, selling houses that at the time averaged about seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars. That is a lot of houses, and it's one thing to close those houses. I mean, it's one thing. If you're in the real estate business, you know this. It's one, th the one thing to have a million dollars worth of sales. It's a whole other thing to have a million dollars worth of closed business, getting those things all the way to where they close, because a lot of, a lot of sales fall through. But she closed a million dollars worth. Well, I was selling homes too, and plus I had, uh, I was managing a real estate office. I had 60 agents under me, and not only did I get my commissions, but I got a little piece of everything they did. I'm just saying we were doing good. We were, we were, we were on. Now we were lost as we could be, but I know what it is to serve money. Listen, every decision that I made, where are we going to live? How does this affect where we're going to live? How does this affect the kind of car we drive? How does this affect how we're going to educate our kids? How does this affect, the, how does this decision affect our, our status in the community? Every decision that I made one way or the other, had to do with money. I know what that life is, serving money instead of serving God. And I thank God that that root was cut off in me. And not completely, but a big death blow was put to it the very day, the very week that I got born again. Never been able to be motivated by money the same way I was then. Now, I've made some mistakes regarding money since then. And I'm talking about doctor and I, I fell into the trap of the prosperity teachers during the 80s because they were all teaching the same thing and I'm just a little, like a little bird with my mouth open and I didn't, this long before I met Dave Roberson and knew how to meditate the word myself and how to pray in tongues and all of that. So, you know, I fell into some traps. 
but uh, all, most of those are exposed in the teachings that I have at the website, GaryCarpenter.org. If you get over into the Kingdom Finances section, you'll, you'll see correct teaching on all of that. Anyway, I don't mean to digress that much, I guess. But see, I just I'm, the point is, I know what it is, the difference between serving mammon and serving God. And Jesus, of course, was absolutely right. You can't do both at the same time. Even if you're even if you're really good as a gospel entrepreneur, if your heart motivation making that money, if your heart motivation is personal profit, you're you're going to have trouble. <laughs> That's one master. If your motivation is profit for the kingdom, and it's going to go for the kingdom, now you're on the right path. Again, I'm not going to. I'm not going when he shows me these little pictures I'm going to stay with them. I have met more than one gospel entrepreneurs who absolutely had the call. They loved Jesus. They started out right. We're going to start a business. We're going to start this. We're going to start that. And we're going to make money for the kingdom of God. And they start out well until they start making the money. <laughs> and once the, if the money really starts coming in more than you've ever seen before. <laughs> First off, it's amazing how all of a sudden now we want to go back under the tithe, you know. <laughs> hey, that tithe thing, that was really a pretty good deal because 90% is mine and only 10% is the Lord's. But see, stewarding the pound or the talent, Lord, thy pound hath gained 10 pounds. And they gave it all to the Lord, <laughs> not, nine, not 10%. But it's amazing. That first million comes in. There's actually a million dollars. Maybe this would be a time to go back under the tide. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but it's amazing that, well, yeah, we're going to give into the kingdom. but see if that root isn't killed. But, you know, really, that's right after we need a, we need a better house. You know, we're going, to, we're going to get a better house. And, and uh, of course, our car, you know, we need, a, we need another car. And actually, we need two new cars. And then pretty soon... You know, we, we haven't, we need to take a cruise, you know, and, uh, and, oh, we need a vacation home. That's what we need. Yeah. And I'm just saying, if, if you don't make a clean break between your provision, what you live on, and, a, and, and your service to the king, see, he said that your, your servant's going out to plow uh, or milk the cows or feed the cattle. Your job is to make the money. And when you, the cat, when you come in in the evening, the cattle are still his, the milk is his. <laughs> okay, the fields are his, right? When you come in from your labor in the financial arena, the money is his. Okay, that's just, you just can't get much more simple than that. Okay, if, you, if that's all new to you, rewind a few weeks and make sure you hear those lessons on stewarding the pound. Okay. Now let me pick this back up here. Well, so when Jesus say, say, <laughs> when Jesus says, say, we are unprofitable servants, what he's talking about there is we are not in this for personal profit. We are not hirelings. We are bond slaves by our own free will choice. We serve for love's sake alone and not for personal profit. See, <laughs> The parable of the ten talents gives us a second witness that this is the, the attitude that his master wants his servants to have. Notice that he commended those faithful servants who had traded their money and gathered increase. Notice also that he increased the scope of their authority. He promoted them in their stewardship. And But also notice he didn't pay them at the end of the day. He didn't pay them. See, they're not in it for hire. They're not in it for personal profit. That is the attitude of heart that Jesus is trying to reveal to his disciples. Just go back to Luke 15, 1, where Jesus is out ministering amongst the sinners. What, is he doing that for personal profit? Is he going to punch his time clock at the end of the day and say, I'm ready for my paycheck now? No. <laughs> You've got to be kidding. He's doing that because that's, that's who he is, the son, heir of all that the father has. But he is doing this for love's sake alone. He's doing this. This is what his job is. This is what he does in his father's fields. What, about, what are you here for? Seek and save the lost. That's what I do. Okay. <laughs> he, 
Yeah. See, bond slaves do not expect a bond slave. A bond slave is different than a conquered slave. A bond slave is one who's really uh, has been set free. They've finished their time of servitude, whatever got them into that situation. It, it, you're free now. You've finished. You're free. You can go. But a bond slave says, Boy, you, Master, you've been really good to me and my family. You've taken good care of us. We love serving you. I know we're free, but can we stay? Can we just stay and be your servants? And Even though we're free, but we want to stay and be your bond slave on purpose because we want to, for love's sake. You're, you've been good to us. We want to serve you, Master. Well, that's a bond slave, and that's who we all are to Jesus. He set us free, all right. But we're free. God, let me see today. See, I'm seeing that picture right now. You know what happened to a bond slave? That I mean, he's been before that he was a conquered slave. I mean, he had to do it. But now his time is he, he's finished his time. He's free. He can go free if he wants to. But he says, No, Master, I want to stay. Me and my family. You've been good to us. We want to stay here. We want to serve you. Do you know what happens next? In front of the people, that, that bond slave comes to the master and they go to the doorpost of the master's house one of the one of the doorposts they take the fatty part of his ear and they put it right up against that post and they take something that look, they call it an all awl but it if you look it up it's like an ice pick and they pierce through the fatty part of the ear like you do an earring i guess and it goes right through the ear into the doorpost of the master's house and I, for the longest time, I, 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 what, what, what image is this, you know? But and I didn't look these verses up, but there's verses that say that a bond slave waits every morning at the doorpost of his master. <laughs> the bond slaves come every morning to get their instructions from their Lord. Is that not us? <laughs> Isn't that exactly Saul of Tarsus after he saw on the road to Damascus and the light blinded him and he heard a voice and who are you I am Jesus and what's the first words Lord what would you have me do <laughs> already in his spirit Saul's ear is at the doorpost of the master listening Lord what would you have me do and the longer I'm in this that's my only cry Lord what would you have me do Lord Anything, Lord. What it, you've been so good to me, Master. You've been so good to my family. What would you have me do? And if, it's no different if you're called to serve the Lord in finances. It's no different at all. Mm. See, bond slaves who are first-class servants, they only desire that the needs of their Master be met first. Even at the end of a long, hard day, plowing or feeding cattle or whatever it is they've been doing, you know, uh, making money in the markets, whatever it is. At the end of the day, still, still, before they, before they go eat their own supper, they check in again at the doorpost, I guess. Lord, do you need anything else? Is there anything else you need me to do today? You have any needs, Lord? Before I go meet my, before I go eat supper myself, is there anything you need? Whew. Boy, it's good stuff. Now another, this is the first level of a uh, revelation that I had was my grandfather's farm. And so quickly, we've been through this many times, but quickly let me refresh your memory. Listen, my grandfather had, uh, had a large farm. It was a farm slash ranch because they, they did grow corn and other crops. and uh, But they also had black Angus cattle. And uh, but there was, he had 12 kids, about half boys and half girls. And everybody had work to do on that farm. Everybody. I mean, you know, the depending on how old the boys were, you know, the I mean, the young ones, maybe they would grease the wheels on the combine, but the older son, he might drive the combine. So when you're a little bitty toddler, like maybe three years old or something, your job is to just sit on the buckboard with grandpa. <laughs> Boy, he takes great delight in you too. And all, all day long, your whole job, sit next to grandpa. But he did his job well, you know. <laughs> Grandpa's probably more pleased with him than anybody. <laughs> but the, and the ladies too. I mean, there's so much work to do on that place. I mean, the crops when they come in, they have to be uh, harvested. They have to be the food has to be prepared. 
during canning season, I remember, man, the boiling pots of water and the mason jars and they're putting tomatoes and all these different things in these jars and sealing them up. They had a big root cellar where they'd, you know, they'd store all of that because later on during the winter when the snow's on the ground, you're going to be needing those tomatoes, you know, and uh, cooking the meals and the clothes. And what the point is, everybody, everybody in the family had work to do. Everybody. Even the toddler sitting on the on the buckboard wagon with grandpa. <laughs> but see, at the end of the day, they didn't come in expecting a paycheck. This is a family business. No, at the end of the day, that, that, that grandpa had a great big table there. And I mean, that thing would be loaded down with mashed potatoes and gravy and fried chicken and usually steak because they raised cattle and roast beef and biscuits as big as your hand and about two inches thick and you'd slice that open and the steam coming off you could just feel the steam coming off of it and slather on some of that butter that was churned on the porch now and some sorghum molasses sun <laughs> and everybody's supposed to eat to the full you know and if somebody had a religious complex you know like maybe there's one son he says you know i didn't do my job very well today i I don't think I greased the wheels just right, and I don't deserve to eat a full meal like everybody else. You know, I, I'll, I'll I'll just have one chicken wing. That's a, I mean, there's all of this food, but I'm just going to have one little chicken wing. That's all I that's all I get. You know, because I'm just not worthy. <laughs> God, <laughs> if Grandpa was sitting there and he saw one of his kids, everybody else has got mounds of food on their plate. You know, corn and green beans. You're sitting there with your chicken wing. He'd go what? Why are you just eating a chicken wing? What's wrong with you? you? You know, and you go. Well, I didn't do a good job today. I didn't grease the wheel. I, you know, in our in church, it's I didn't pray enough. I didn't fast. I didn't this. I didn't that. Grandpa would look at you like, boy. <laughs> I can almost hear his voice. <laughs> My dad's a dad. <laughs> I can almost hear his voice, boy. What's wrong with you? <laughs> You don't eat at my table based on your performance. You eat at my table because you're my son. God, man, do you feel that when that... <laughs> Whew, man, <laughs> you eat at my table because you're my son. Now, you, I'll show you how to do better in your performance. But listen, you load that plate up. Pass that boy some mashed potatoes. Get some of them biscuits down there. <laughs> <laughs> He's going to be working tomorrow. He's going to need to eat. <laughs> Boy, if we'd only lose that religion and get the understanding that Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a family. You are in a family. He loves you. You are his own spirit-born child. He may not, like any family, we may have days we need a whooping. I've had my whoopings before. It didn't change the fact my daddy loved me. <laughs> He's doing... Even the whooping was good for me. But anyway. <laughs> but you see the point. That dinner table of grace is for the family. And it, you, you, sit, you get to eat there because you are his child. That's what Jesus was teaching in Matthew, yes, Matthew chapter 6. Specifically on your provision. He says, listen, he feeds the birds. And they don't plow. They don't sow. They don't gather in the barns. He, he clothes the lilies. Are you kidding? They're dressed better than Solomon. And they don't do anything for that. He, you know, and so he says, aren't you worth more than them? That's I like to say it this way. He, he takes care of the birds. They're his pets. He clothes every flower. That's his garden. He loves his pets. He loves his garden. But you're his child. If he takes care of his pets in his garden, don't you know he's going to take care of you? Boy, that's Jane see the ball right there. It just can't get much more simple than that. He said, why are you worrying about this stuff? Your job is to seek first the kingdom. Serve, see, serve God instead of mammon. Your job is to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. Now live right, live holy. And if you do that, listen, all these things will be added unto you. You know, one of the main reasons, I believe, why, you know, in that same teaching, one of the verses, he says, you know, your, your Heavenly Father knows what you have need of. I like to say it this way. He's not stupid. God knows that in America, 
<laughs> you're going to need a car, most likely. You're going to need an apartment or a house. You're going to need clothes. You, he's not dumb. He knows what you have need of, not notice, before you ask him. And James says, you have not because you ask not. I think one of the reasons that we do without, we, we honestly don't see our Father as our provider. See, how would you do that at the dinner table? You know, I need mashed potatoes. Uh, Father, uh, pass the mashed potatoes, please. <laughs> or could I have some mashed potatoes? Would you pass the mashed potatoes? It'd be no more difficult than that. What would you expect? Here comes the mashed potatoes. He knows what you have need of before you ask him. When's the last time you asked him? Okay. All of the teachings like that are at the Kingdom Finances section of GaryCarpenter.org. Lots of, lots of them. <laughs> I don't have them on, in YouTube format, but they're there in MP3 format. And you can be listening to them in your car or whatever. Okay. I don't know if he's going to have me redo those or not. We'll see. <laughs> I just work here. <laughs> I'll get my instructions to go plow the fields or feed the cattle. <laughs> you know. <laughs> Okay, so that's the first level of revelation, and that's pretty much what I have at the website right now. But see, later on, as I continue to pray, I still, there's more under deeper, deeper levels of understanding, because it's even more than that. See, that's pretty good. If we just stopped right there, that's pretty good. I'm in a family. I'm not in a religion. What he's after is for me to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. He'll take care of me. I don't have to be like the Gentiles and spend my whole life serving money. I can serve God. And he will take care of what I need. There it is. I mean, it's just real simple, okay? But still, it's, there's even deeper revelation than that. So, let's get back to verse 9, okay? Luke 17, verse 9. That's the verse that says, after the, after the servants have gone out into the field, feeding cattle, plowing, whatever they're doing, and they've, they've done their job, does he thank that servant? Okay, in the gospel entrepreneur, you went out into the financial field today and you made $100,000. And you came in, laid it at the master's feet. Does he thank that servant? <laughs> okay. Does he thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I trow not, certainly not. See, I'll be honest with you, Jesus is meek and mild and kind and generous and I mean, he can get angry. There's times when he gets angry, but most, I just always thought it was a little strange <laughs> that he wouldn't even thank the servant for doing such a good job. I just thought it was strange, you know. Boy, come to find out, oh, just, you better, if you had a dad Hagen say it, you better get your shouting clothes on. We're going, we're getting into some good stuff here now. <laughs> get ready. <laughs> See, so does he thank that servant? For many years, I did not. I mean, many years, I did not fully understand why Jesus said that the master did not thank the servant for doing the things that were commanded him. I know it's not required of a master to do that with a servant, but it just seemed a little ungracious to me. It didn't seem Jesus-like, you know. But one day while I was meditating on this passage, oh, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Thank God for hours praying in other tongues. Thank God for praying the mysteries of God. But one day when I was just med I was just really doing what Dave taught us. I'm just reading through Luke again. I was assimilating the word. And if you don't know what assimilating is, go to daveroberson.org. When you get there, on the left-hand side, one of the buttons you can click on says series. When you get to that page, just scroll down and the title is something like assimilation and meditation or assimilation of the word or something like that. It's got assimilation in it. Boy, that changed my life and it'll change yours. Back to this. I was just meditating on this passage one day and I heard the Holy Spirit ask me a simple question. I'm telling you this question changed my life and I believe it'll change yours. He said, the Holy Spirit said, when was the last time you thanked your hand for obeying your mind? <laughs> when was the last time you thanked your hand for obeying your mind. And I thought, I, I don't thank my hand for obeying my mind. My, my hand is just part of 
me. And those verses in John 17, which I didn't look up for you, those verses in John 17, Father, I pray that they all may be one, even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be one as we are. That vertical union, when you get born again, Christ comes in, but the Father's in him, see? And I, I, all these verses, my hand is just part of me. And I hear Jesus saying that, and then I hear, I and my Father are one. See, about then, I'll just read what I wrote here. About then, the revelation struck me. Far from being ungracious, the real reason the Lord does not thank us for obeying Him is He sees us as being a part of Him in precisely the same way that we see our hand as being a part of us. My understanding of the whole master-servant relationship between the Lord Jesus and myself was instantly changed, and it's still changed to this day. That relationship is much more intimate than I had ever realized before. Up until now, I had seen Jesus as the master and myself as his servant laboring in the fields, and there's truth to that. That is true. But when the workday was finished, I sort of saw myself, once I was sure the master's needs were met, I saw myself kind of going to my home, and Jesus laid down in his home, you know. I saw this separation between Jesus and myself. Hang on, got pages are sticking here a little bit. But see, Jesus desires that we be so vitally joined together with him that our relationship is much the same as our hand to our mind. We, my hand and my mind, we are one. <laughs> This hand is part of my body. My mind is in my body. Look, watch this. 76. Come on. That's not bad for 76. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> my, are those fingers? Are those fingers? For those that might not can see me, I'm just moving my fingers really fast in a random way. But see, my fingers aren't choosing to do that. They're not doing that on their own. They're not. That's not their will. My fingers have no will. Okay. They are receiving instant, constant communication from my mind and are reacting. I can type like that too. Sue and I can still type like the wind. We had a teacher named Mr. Browning. Both of us had him in the eighth grade. I think it was eighth, might've been ninth. Anyway, that guy was a typing son of a gun. <laughs> and he, got, he, he trained us to type and man, we can both type like the wind, even in our seventies. And I, who knew that that was gonna be such a big part of my calling in the body of Christ to type all these lessons. I, I do a lot of typing every day. Anyway, the point is this. My fingers, my hand, is in constant, direct communication with my mind all the time. And look how quick is that. My, my fingers don't go, uh, Master. <laughs> Sorry, tickled me. Master, what would you have me do? And then go, wait and fast <laughs> pray although i believe in fa waiting and fasting and praying but see we've got we've got this wrong understanding jesus is the head we are the body we've got to understand there's he intends for us to have constant instant communication with him just like my fingers have with my brain <laughs> it's not like i'm going to master what gary what would you have me do my hand says and then 30 days later you know, get an understanding. Get Oh, move one finger. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Brrr, look at that. Brrr. Instant, instant, constant communication right now between my mind and my hand. And he wants that with his body. Thank God for Dave Roberson who introduced these foundational truths. But we're taking it to revival. We're taking it all the way. He intends for the mind. We are the body. He is the head. He is the mind. We are the hand. And he intends for us to have constant, instant communication with him by way of the Holy Ghost all the time. That's why he's, this is why Jesus, Jesus had it. That's why he says, I don't do anything. I don't do anything except I see my father do it or I hear my father say it. In other words, it's just exactly like my hand. My hand doesn't do anything of its own will. It doesn't have any will of its own. 
even when I just move my fingers like this, it's because that's the will of my mind. Mm, are you, I hope you're getting some of this. Man, it's, it's blessing me whether you're getting blessed or not. <laughs> my hand is not in competition with my mind. My hand does not have a separate agenda from my mind. Said another way, my hand does not seek any glory <laughs> at the expense of my, my mind. My hand does not desire praise from other people. In the same way, when we give, we are not to seek glory or praise from the people we're given to. We are simply the hand of Christ, obeying the promptings within us. We're obeying Him. All glory goes to God our Father and to our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, how does Jesus see each one of us? We are His body, all of us. We are His body. We are so much a part of Him that He sees no separation between Himself and us. God. Do you feel? <laughs> There's times I just feel that anointing just zoom through me. <laughs> without Him, we have no life within us. Without us, He has no physical body on the earth. What a privilege to be so vitally connected and useful for the Master. <laughs> what, what would you think? I give an instruction to my hand, whatever it is. Uh, let's just, okay, let's pick some. A hand, reach into the wallet, get $10, and give it to Joe over there. And my hand goes, what's in it for me? <laughs> That's a snorting day. <laughs> Sorry. I, t I crack me up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Reach into my wallet, give ten, get ten dollars, and 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 go give it to Joe over there. And my hand goes, "What's in it for me? If if there's nothing in it for me, I ain't doing it." Well, that's the un that's that servant that really was unprofitable. <laughs> my hand doesn't have any separate agenda. It doesn't resist my mind. You know what else it doesn't do? It says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get $100 out of your wallet and give it to Joe. And I'm going, what? <laughs> I didn't give you any instruction like that. I, I told you to give $10. Just give $10. I'm giving 100 Give 10 Anyway. <laughs> when it's working the way it's supposed to work, my hand has no agenda of its own. It, it doesn't resist my will. My hand, let's say it again. My hand and I are one. We are a unit. We work together. Christ and us are a unit. We work together. He sees us exactly as being joined to Him, the same way our hand is joined to us. God, that's just good preaching right there. I'm just telling you, that's good stuff. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, suppose you've just given some money, much needed money, to a poor family, and they're just desperate for help, you know, and you come along, you give them some money. And they start going, oh, thank you very much. You are so generous. We are in such need. And then you came to help us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And, you know, that kind of response, I guess, would be appropriate unless they were saying those things to your hand instead of you. <laughs> you went and you gave them money. You know, I don't know, 50 bucks. You gave them money. And the, you're right here, right? But they are, you know that old thing about talk to the hand? <laughs> They are literally talking to your hand. I mean, you're standing right there, but they're not talking to you. They're just looking right at the hand, the hand that handed that ha the hand that handed them the fifty bucks. Oh, thank you, hand. Thank you so much. You're such a good hand. And you're going. I'm standing right here. You know, <laughs> you're standing right there. Yet they're 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 holding on to your hand and they're giving thanks to your hand instead of you. They're not thanking you. They had their eyes completely focused on your hand. And they're, they're thanking your hand, not you, for the gift. See, you would think that behavior to be bizarre, <laughs> you know? You'd be thinking, well, it wasn't my hand's idea to help you. That thought originated in my mind. I'm the one that loved you and wanted to help you. I'm the one that gave the money to you. I'm the one you ought to be thanking. See, my hand is simply my servant. It just does what I tell it to tell it to do. I don't even think my hand, I don't even thank my hand for obeying me. My hand is just part of me. But see, in the same way that we consider our hands to be a part of us, Jesus considers us to be a part of him. We are his body. Jesus is alive and well. 
and he himself in his glorified body is seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven. He has no physical body on the earth except us. We are literally the body of Christ on earth. Let me get where I'm supposed to be here. Okay. He cannot lay hands on the sick unless he can get a believer to do it. He, can, he cannot preach the gospel. He has no lips to preach the gospel with and can't do it unless he can get a believer to do it. And he has no hands to give money to the poor unless he can get a believer to do it. We're the ones with the hands. Okay, now here's the third level of revelation. We've got about 10 minutes. You're going to really like this. So the first revelation is family. The second revelation, we are his body. He doesn't really see us as separate. We are one with Christ. The same way he says, I and my Father are one. We are one with Christ. The same way your hand is one with you. Now, one more revelation. In John 15, verse 5, if you want to look it up, Jesus says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, without me, you can do nothing. While Jesus was on earth in his own human body, the Father was the vine, and Jesus was the branch. Did you know the prophet, the prophet spoke of the coming Messiah as being the branch? Now here he says, I'm the vine, you're the branch, but there's a reason. We'll get to it in a minute. It was prophesied, though, that Jesus at first would be the branch. Let me show you the prophecy. If you want to see it in your Bible, it's Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And there shall, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch. And in the King James, it's even capitalized, branch. They know this is talking about the Messiah. And a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. It's talking about Jesus prophesying that Jesus, when he comes, would be the branch. But yet here, Jesus said he's the vine. Why? See, notice this is John 15. We're just hours away from the, Jesus being arrested, the crown of thorns, the beating, the scourging, the cross, everything. We're just hours away from that. Up until this point, Jesus has been the branch and the Father has been the vine. The Father's in heaven, but Jesus had a physical body on the earth. Okay, the, the life is in the vine. So the Father was the vine. It's the Father in me. He's doing the works, but Jesus was the branch. If you look at any grapevine, you're going to find out the fruit does not appear on the vine. The vine, what appears on the vine? Branches branches come off and the fruit appears on the branches the reason jesus is just now saying this right right at just hours before the the cross up until now he has been the branch he has been the only human vessel on planet earth where it had the life of the father as the vine the father's in heaven he plainly says the father's in heaven but by his spirit the father is inside of christ he said, it's the Father in me doing the works, but notice the works appear on the branch. <laughs> and as long as he had his own physical body, Jesus was the branch. But now, let me just read it here. Uh, when Jesus now speaks of himself being the vine, Jesus is about to be crucified, buried, resurrected, and raised up in his glorified body to sit at the right hand of the Father God. He himself will no longer have a body on planet Earth except the bodies of believers, born-again Christians. Jesus now is in heaven. He is the vine to us. It's through Christ we receive the life. And still the Father is in him. Okay. Now Christ is the vine and we are the branches because we're the ones with the physical bodies on Earth. While he had a physical body on earth himself, he was the branch. But now he's been glorified. Now he's the vine. He's the source of life for us. And we're the ones with the physical bodies on earth. And we are the branches. That's why he says now, from this point on, I am the vine and you are the branches. This makes so much sense to me. Christ lives in us. The Father is in him by the Holy Spirit. And the fruit is supposed to appear 
on the branches. That's us. The fruit is supposed to appear on the branches. Because we are the ones with the physical bodies on planet Earth. We are, the, we are one with Christ. The same way our hand is one with our own mind. There it is again. I want you to see it again. Look at that. You think my fingers are making those decisions? No. All those instructions are coming from my mind. My mind and my hand are one. My mind and my hand are one. Christ in heaven and you on earth are one. Mm. Man. <laughs> we're going somewhere, people. We're, we're headed to revival. We're going to take this. What Dave started, we're going to finish. And when I say Dave, it's God through Dave, I know. But Dave was obedient to his calling, and he laid a foundation for us. And we're to take that foundation and run with it all the way into revival. And we're going. We're going there. Hang on. How did Dave say it? You're going to be a happy camper. You're going to be glad you stayed in there. <laughs> See, God, God's plan for us, there is, to, you know, all these blue, what we call the blueprint prophecies, come away with me. Spend time with me. I want intimacy. I want fellowship. What's he trying to do? He's trying to develop us to the point that our relationship with the head is like my mind and my fingers. Instant, constant communication, instant obedience, instant. Whatever, whatever my hand say, whatever my mind says, my, my hand does. It's to be like that with us, the body, Christ in heaven, whatever he says we do. God, there it was again. I don't know if you ever feel that, but anyway. <laughs> there is to be an intimate relationship with us in Christ. There is to be instant, perfect, constant communication between the mind of Christ and us at all times. Christ doesn't thank us for obeying Him. Christ seizes us as being Him. <laughs> or being one with Him, if that, if that fits you better. No wonder the Spirit continues to woo us by these prophecies into intimacy. He keeps saying, come away with me. Spend time with me. Boy, I love this lesson. I thank God he doesn't need to thank that servant. I always thought it was being impolite a little bit. No, 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 no. Just the opposite. He so values you. He sees you as being him. <laughs> he sees you as being one with him. The same way you see your hand as being one with you. He sees you as being one with him. Whew. Love you so much. See you next time. Bye-bye.